Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank His Excellency, the Ambassador, Professor Janie Anderson and uh, Professor Marziano Melotti for the privilege and, pre pre um, and, and pleasure of being here today. I was going to thank Hamish as well, but it's also already been done. The Renaissance represents the golden age of gastronomy in Italy, which held a position of undisputed hegemony. The, the era also represents the flourishing of Italian gastronomic literature. Here, let me introduce you to Bartolomeo Scappi, the secret cook to Pope Pius V, who wrote this monumental work called Opera, the most significant of all cookery treatises of the Renaissance, and is quite unique for its iconographic value because it's the only book in the world that contains 27 plates that illustrate the Renaissance banquet. And here we have Christopher da Messis Bugo, who served the Estense court, who wrote Banchetti, the first documentation of the arts at the table. Today, I'd like to extend an invitation to a splendid Renaissance banquet, the most spectacular exhibition of opulence and elegance imaginable. Walls hung with superb tapestries like these, depicting the banquet. And here we can admire the extraordinary credenza on the back of a giant tortoise, a sumptuous multi-level showcase for glittering gilded silverware, rock crystal bound with gold for precious wines resplendent as jewels, lustrous ceramics, and symbolical table ships. A truly spectacular stage for all the arts, where music, dance, and theater created a feast for the spirit as well as a feast for the senses, such as in this banquet offered to Charles V, you'll see him at the head of the table, where no less than 796 different dishes were served. I do hope you don't get verbal indigestion. Clearly, the complexity of the banquet required new techniques and innovative professions, such as the scalco, the grand supervisor, the copiera, the cupbearer, but prominence probably goes to the carver, an extraordinary theatrical figure who, with a formidable range of knives, perf performed an acrobatic act in the air, and where he would dexterously slice, chop, and cut a leg of lamb, a pike, an artichoke, even an egg, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and it would all magically fall into the plate. If the carver would carve by holding the food on the table, it would be immediately recognized that he was a second-hand carver, and this would, uh, of course, reflect on the prince's prestige, because the banquet has a precise system of communication. Every single aspect of the banquet is invested with ingenious creativity, such as the art of napkin folding, where snowy white linen was carefully starched and ironed, no bleach, no steam irons, and then followed a thousand folds for months and months. Clearly, time and money were no object, no trade unions, to form these fantastic shapes, castles, towers, and animals. And after three centuries of apparent extinction, I managed to revive this. And here we have a fish from my recent uh, exhibition, an archway the peacock, a tower, and the tortoise. Clearly, the table was pure theater, a gorgeous display described by a chronicler as arches, castles, galleries, and works of art which put nature to shame. The key, key word was clearly magnificence. All this ostentation was really a strategy to enthrall the guests 
who were almost caught in the powerful web of enchantment. Machiavelli, in chapter eight of The Prince, writes of Oliverotto da Fermo, who planned to visit his uncle to expound his valorous qualities and offer his services. There he was royally received and he had a palazzo of three stories. After some time, he decided to honor his uncle in the court with a marvelous banquet. I quote, when all the wonderful viands and all the splendid entertainments ended, Oliverato artfully began certain grave discourses and suggested that his uncle and his retinue continue the conversation in a private chamber where they were all slaughtered. The chronicler Sforza Pallavicini described the food as an extraordinary array of dishes dressed with pomp and splendor, a glorious expression of luxury and wealth. Perhaps you're wondering what the taste of the food was like, because today we tend to make a clear-cut distinction between the savory and the dessert. All min meals begin with the savory and end with the dessert. Not so in the Renaissance where all flavors combine together to form a very particular adventure of the palate. Here we have, for example, the sweet and sour flavor that was ever present with um, candied fruits and figs and aromatic vinegars, particularly fashionable at the time, were perfumed waters especially rose water. This is an almoxara for the dispersal of rose water, so fashionable at the time, which left a distinct flowery aftertaste. All these flavors combine to create a unique sensory experience. But sugar was considered the most sublime of edible substances. You have a lacrima d'amore, a tear of love, which is a perfumed water encapsulated in a sugar sphere. And if you will taste it now, you will taste something very close to the Renaissance. Do you have one? Everyone, everyone have one? Two, three, four? Okay. During the Renaissance, sweetness reigned supreme, and it was the most desirable, the most dreamt of gastronomic experience. You can see how this little man, instead of selling his wares, is utterly involved in his sweet dreamland. Um, sugar was, in point of fact, the iconic food of the aristocracy, a status symbol par excellence, and certainly sugar sculpture represented the peak of all ephemeral art forms. This is an extraordinary drawing where the sugar sculpture is depicted as a landscape. And you can see the castles and exotic animals and coats of arms in comparison to the guests that are really a half the size, indicating how important they really were. Sweetness was known as a princely passion, as it represented both wealth and power. We don't have time to go into the fascinating history of sugar, but just a glimpse of from sugar cane to sugar cone. And I would like to recall Venice, where the statutes go back to the year 1226, and archival documents indicate all the varieties and forms of sugar which were imported at the times. You can see the very wide variety. Just another word about another important aspect, and that was the medicinal value of sugar, which was already present in the 13th and 14th century. Sugar was considered uh, a real uh, remedy for all kinds of diseases. Here I found a book on the plague. And we have 12 pages which say that if you take all these syrups, these juleps, these preserves, these confections, you will avoid getting the plague. You might get diabetes along the way, but never mind. <laughs> 
sugar was the crowning glory of the Renaissance table, and it's interesting to note that at court banquets, the epitome of all tastes took on five different roles. Sugar was to be found in every single kind of dish, meat, fish, soup, vegetable, bianco mangiare. Renaissance gastronomic literature, literature abounds with recipes that all end with sprinkled sugar on top to form a delicious crystalline crust. Platina da Cremona, the first librarian of the Vatican Library, wrote De Oneste Voluptate et Valetudine, and here we see a wonderful uh, page of the illuminated manuscript, in which he wrote, there is no dish which cannot be improved with sugar. Sugar was also used to glaze all kind of pasticcio and tarts, which were bedecked with strips of sugar in trellis work. All banquets ritually opened with a galaxy of sweetmeats, such as sugared strawberries, marzipan delights, and mostacholi biscuits. And all banquets concluded with a glorious array of almond paste desserts, candied fruits, and especially confetti, in English, comforts. This is a confetti holder from the exhibition. It's slightly blurred because the, this area was, was covered with a veil of tulle, and this confetti holder is made out of sugar and decorated with sugar flowers and sugar leaves as well. Certainly, the Renaissance was the era in which confectionery was perfected in Italy. And in this painting, we have five different representations of confection, from the sugar cone to be grated on the right, to la torta marzapanata, very fashionable at the time, which the server is holding on the right. Sugar embellished everything. Even small game birds were dressed up in shirts of shiny pistachio sugar pastes. And now for a surprise, because even during religious festivities, despite the prohibition of meat, giant hams would appear masquerading on the table covered with pink marzipan. Now, sugar was so socially predominant, and the lust for all things sweet by priests and prelates was so strong that they invented a new kind of repast. And this repast was based exclusively on confectionery and sweetmeats, nothing else. Now, here we have the um, scenery for De Umana Vitae, which was done by Giovanni Grimaldi, and after which a colazione followed. And they served 76 different kinds of candied fruit and vegetables. We don't have time, obviously, for me to tell them to you all. Um, and all these dulcet delicacies were extremely appreciated. Interesting point is that in the secret archives of the Vatican, we have the accounts for all of these um, events, and we have a letter, we, actually there are two letters of Grimaldi, complaining that he had not been paid out in full, yet the exorbitant accounts for these confectionaries were paid out showing their social significance. It was in this context that sugar um, became a, an artistic medium and uh, sugar crystals uh, underwent a un metamorphosis to, to become um, a thousand extraordinary shapes and figures that we will see. Many artists dedicated themselves to sugar art. For example, Gian Lorenzo Bernini. Here we have a drawing by Bernini showing the Venus, which is both an alchemical and a Christian symbol. Yet another one by Bernini. If you look at the lower left-hand corner, you may be able to see his signature. And here we have a wonderful collection of 20 different drawings from the Estensa court. Um, the particular thing that I noticed about these while studying the documents that did not accompany them was that they were not served for 100 guests, but for four and six, showing us that in point of fact, these exquisite artistic decorations were present also in everyday life. 
Here we find the sugar arabesques holding up the food. There's a wonderful paper banquet when a giant mortadelle is cooked in wine and then majestically held up by two enormous seahorses wrought out of sugar, of course. During the 16th, the 15th, and the 16th and 17th century, sugar sculpture reigned. Oh, sorry, this is not a sugar sculpture. Um, but uh, Archimbaldo tends, with his creative genius, to always manage to astonish us, which is really what sugar sculpture does. And because uh, we don't have so much access today, I do hope your heads will turn with this one or maybe by the basket of fruit. But I did manage to find a table decoration drawn by, it's the only one, drawn by Archimboldo of a sea monster driven by Cupid. Now, I would like you to have another taste to accompany you on your journey, a taste of history. And we will look now at these extraordinary drawings which show us the extreme difficulty in creating these masterpieces, as you can well imagine. Um, you didn't just need the technique and the dexterity, you needed a lot of good fortune. There were two basic methods. The one required pouring molten sugar into a double terracotta mold, which had to be then tightly bound until it was ready. Was it ready? Was it not ready? With all the obvious hazards. And the other one is the molding of sugar paste and putting together statues such as we have the um, Cupid, uh, which has come all the way from Stockholm, traveling to Rome, to Doha, to Australia, and um, he's very happy to be here. And he says, if you'd like to come down and talk to him, the language of love is universal. <laughs> now, in these two drawings, we do really appreciate the extraordinary detail, the fragility, and the finesse. Please bear in mind these two shapes, because these two ornaments we're now going to sit down at the circular table and we see all around the table alternate these two sugar sculptures that we've just seen. In the center, we have a monumental six foot creation, which I hope takes your breath away. And if it does, the sugar confectionery, which is on the large platters below, is just about to be served to revive you. During the 16th and 17th century, sugar sculpture reigned supreme, and together with the drawings, they were perceived as highly prized possessions. Perhaps the most exceptional of all receptions was offered to King Henry III of France in Venice in 1597. Unfortunately, we don't have to date any illustrations of this. We read in 14 pages, Ogni cosa meravigliosa et extraordinaria era di zucchero. All the glassware, the plates, the tablecloths, every single thing on the table was made of sugar, as well as, of course, everything that they ate. And the culminating moment was the presentation of 11 sugar sculptures. At the time, 24 had been made which had been created from the drawings of San Sovino. The king was honored by the gift, but being so totally enamored with them, he insisted on buying them all. So here, let me show you an extraordinary bottiglieria. The bottiglieria is a table reserved for serving the beverages, completely covered in sugar. Sugar stalactites and sugar stalagmites. And we will see on the top the goblets and the amphora ready to be served. I do hope that something of a touch of the marvelous comes through, through um, for this very neglected subject. Um, by and large, um, 
I don't think that we, dis we disclose our research before publication. And my new book, which deals with a manuscript of the confectioner of Pope Alexander VII, um, has a lot of new material on sugar sculptures. But bearing in mind this exceptional event, I would like to share some of this research with you. So here we have an analysis of the different kinds of sugar sculptures, which start off with the single subjects. The subjects are on the left-hand side. The examples are on the right-hand side. So you can see the extent of the phenomenon. And then we have complex subjects, such as many which we're about to see. We have monumental sculpture, which is sometimes covered in gold and sometimes bordered in gold. And often the uh, triomphi are made of different kinds of material. Here we have the table of Clement IX. We have the heraldry in the center, his coat of arms, the Last Supper in front, a religious scenario of the Stations of the Cross. And here we have a musical aspect with the musicians playing under the Tree of Life and mythological figures. This is called La Chiarezza. It's drawn by Giovanni Paolo Shaw, and it depicts uh, Apollo driving a chariot in a golden haze and is, is uh, truly a spectacular centerpiece. This um, is a drawing by Pierre Paul Savin, which has been watercolored. And I could talk about this one until dinner for sure. But let it suffice to say that Pope Clement IX gave this dinner for Queen Christina, although she had already abdicated. And the Vatican protocol forbade a pope to eat with any woman, not even his mama could eat with him. So this was a considerable transgression because Christina had been instrumental in him gaining the tiara. And how did he choose to celebrate this banquet? By beginning and on the table, we see a host of sugar sculptures. And these sugar sculptures might well have been done by Luigi Fidele because I discovered this madrigal. And this madrigal had been performed also to the king of Sweden, um, where the sugar triumphs and works of sugar were made especially for Her Majesty. In point of fact, the table is always a perfect mirror for society in any era. The return to classical mythology is perfectly reflected in the banquet, where Apollo, Bacchus, Venus, and Diana, I do hope you catch a glimpse of the gods as they parade around the table in the candlelight. Here we have Bacchus descending from the sky, in the exhibition, the veil obviously makes the image a little bit hazy. And here we have the wings of the angel, Roma Sedente, and Cupid, which has been done by Rolf Stolberg, who is the architect in Sweden who did this sugar sculpture, as well as the goddess Fortune with a cornucopia. Uh, one cannot help but be inclined to think that this was the origin for all that white porcelain uh, table decor three centuries later. And here we have a picture from my exhibition which shows the uh, candied uh, pyramids, candied fruit pyramids. And very often on the table, we read that all of a sudden, a tree appeared. And it was all covered with marzipan fruits. I sometimes think that if there is an archetype behind all this glorious feasting, it could well be the banquet of the gods. Um, but recalling the words of Carl Gustav Jung, who said, be serious when nothing else comes to mind, <laughs> allow me to take a step forward in time and conclude with these words. Man 
can live without poetry, music, not easy, and art. Man can live without conscience. Man can live without heart. Man can live without friends, even do without books, but civilized man cannot do without cooks. Thank you. <laughs>